So hi guys, uh, welcome all of you today on my talk, how to write test cases for a faster regression suite. My name is Chitran Singh and uh, I had the quality team at Browser Stack. Today I'm going to share a uh, few pointers on how you and your team can bring down your regression time from hours to minutes. Move fast and break things. Zuckerberg said this 15 years ago, but everyone in the valley, everyone in tech lived it. If you're breaking things on production, you were moving fast enough. Releasing working software was better than perfect software sitting on your computer. This changed everything. Software started getting pushed out the door exponentially faster. MVPs were released faster. And that led to the explosion of tech startups we have seen in the past decade. Move fast and break thing worked. But until a certain point, beyond a certain point of product maturity, quality of product became critical. People now, because now more and more people would be affected when a bug hits production. Take Facebook as an example. Uh, minor oversight led to a million of dollars in losses per minute. When this happened, Mark Zuckerberg realized that fixing a bug on production slowed them down in long run. Facebook had outgrown its motto. Similarly, as more companies in every industry digitally transformed themselves and matured into a software company, the world started running on software. It became more apparent that breaking things were not at all okay. Now, we live in a world where you have to move fast and not break things. Today's most successful companies move fast without breaking things. Companies that win, all of them have one thing in common, they move fast. Trailblazers like Amazon, Netflix, deploy code to production 1,000 of times per day. Then you have companies like Adidas that have become software companies in their own right. Adidas deploys to 50 global markets daily. Speed matters. On the other hand, quality matters just as much. Companies that break things pay a heavy price. Let's look at uh, one example. In 2012, Knight was the largest trader in US equities trading over $21 billion every day. Until one fine day, there was an oversight, a deployment error that fired off automatic trades by mistake. It went on and on without stopping. And unfortunately, there was no kill switch. After 45 minutes, they managed to stop it, but that the firm had lost $460 million. And this loss exceeded their assets and they went bankrupt. These Countless examples on the cost of poor quality actually have, you know, one takeaway for all of us. Bugs on production are bad for business. Each of these three software failures could have been prevented with the right mechanism in place. The question we are facing as a software team is, how do you move fast without breaking things? How do you get quality at speed? There could be many answers to this, but today I will focus on perhaps the most critical element to make this happen, your regression suite. So without further ado, it's time for some learning. So how do you make your regression suite faster? I would cover this in two parts. First, how do you write faster test cases? In this, I'm going to talk about the key practices that we always need to adopt and adhere to. Second, how do you execute these test cases faster? Once you've written the test cases, how do you make sure that they run faster and give early feedback? Let's start with the first one, writing test cases that run faster. In fact, how do you enable yourself or uh, anyone to write test case faster? Anyone when developing an automation framework has the right intent, that the automation should be structured and it should be easy for anyone to add test cases to it, basically, Every developer or a tester structure the framework to have feature file that usually captures the scenarios and requirement of the feature. Step files that contains the code of test steps of a particular test scenario. Form files that are commonly based on page object model design pattern that creates object repository for web UI elements on a web page. However, gradually when more and more test cases are added, added with time, the code becomes bloated and you observe code smell. Then you start thinking quite often that does your code need refactoring? Here are some uh, signs uh, 
that your code is bloated and it is defecting. Is, is it hard to make code changes? For example, uh, one simple UI change in a web page results you to update many files in an automation framework. Or worst, for a UI change like a dashboard revamp, your automation estimates and effort turns out to be huge. Thus, looking at the code, you get confused, like which way method to use, or you observe duplicate helper method that look almost similar. Does your form file classes have 2,000 lines of code? Usually, when we keep automating test cases due to tight timelines and in a hurry, we quite often unknowingly keep adding the code to a single point. I never realize that the form files code has easily crossed 1,000 lines. We often think that will refactor later. That's most VPR. However, that refactor later never comes. Are your functional UI tests extremely flaky or unstable? The team realizes that while we have automated 5,000 or more test cases, however, they quite often ignore that there are almost uh, 1,000 flag test, flaky test cases too. This increases team's analysis time, thus putting brake on the velocity of the team to release features faster to production. Or do you or your team spend a lot of time maintaining code? If the answer to any of this question is yes, then you should consider refactoring your code. So how do you fix this? By focusing on these key points, instrumentation and adoption of right metrics. Second, by revisiting your automation strategy module, focus and practice idle characteristics of a good test case, fixing code smell, that is refactor your code, and finally use of selectors smartly. Hence, let's revisit our basic strategy that help us to focus on fail fast and early feedback, basically towards left shift, metrics, or instrumentation. I'm sure all of you would agree that in today's world, before we do anything, we should know how to measure and track the success so that you are on the right track. Basically, know and prove that your strategy is working. Automation analytics helps. We need to answer to our stakeholders on the expenditure that every penny spent is worth. That is, there is a ROI, return on investment. Instrumentation is key to know if things are working fine. Just like production systems, it is very imperative that we have the right metrics to adopt, monitor, that we are moving in the right direction. Hence, monitoring is crucial. Quite often, some uh, interesting questions are asked to QA managers. How does automation or test team's objectives align to company goals? What is the contribution of quality to the revenue of the company? How fast do you release your code to production? Interestingly, sometimes testers do ask, what is the impact am I creating in the organization? What's my contribution? So how do we know the automation strategy that we have adopted? In fact, the automation done is working and giving us a right ROI. The aim is also to drop the misleading metrics. Hence, the mentioned metrics on the slide are quite helpful. Number of automated test cases created. Measure the total number of new automated tests created and not measure how many manual test cases that are automated in a given period of time. This time can be a week, month, or a quarter. Second, number of bugs found in production. Measure how many bugs make it through production and don't measure how many bugs are caught during development. This metric will help you to measure how effective is your automation coverage. It will also indicate the confidence level of the team. If thousands of unit and integration and entry tests are written by the team and the confidence level is very low, then all the effort and money spent is totally wasted. The morale of team goes down. So number of P0s of P1 bugs found in production also adds to the reputation of the product and hence the company. Execution time. The time taken by a CACD pipeline, a build, a test case, test steps is important. Measure the time taken by each of them. Identify and apply the right thresholds. Also measure the build and overall CACD pipeline time. It is a good practice if the instrumentation is done at the granular level. For example, if you have instrumentation at 
support pull request time or checkout time, deploy time. This basically helps you to know the metric is how it is contributing to the your company's goal, and in fact, what is the time to market once a particular code or PR is raised. Number of times a test case fail. Measure the stability of a test case. How flaky is it? The aim should always be to decrease this number. It helps in the increasing the productivity of a tester who is analyzing the results. And last, second last, the test case failure category. Capture and categorize the test case failures. Is it a genuine product failure? Uh, is it an environment issue? Is it a automation script bug? Nowadays, uh, with many ML and AI tools like uh, reportportal.io, uh, which can automatically mark when a test case fails as soon as build finishes. This will not only increase the efficiency of the team, but helps automate further corrective steps to be taken when a particular failure is detected. For example, when you're running a test on a device and category identified as a browser test, you know that framework should automatically read on the test. Last, the resource utilization. Every machine where test runs has a dollar value associated with it. That is, a resource is always costly. Monitoring of CPU, buffer, swap memory, disk, network, and so on. Every, every, everything is crucial. It helps to detect bugs, underutilization of a machine. It helps you to optimize and finally save dollars. If you carefully ponder on the matters just mentioned, then you would observe that this metrics helps in making the productivity of the team. If you're releasing features faster with high velocity, then it directly impacts the revenue as customer get features passed with a great sense of care and acknowledgement. With the adoption of A-B testing frameworks across the industry, these metrics in fact have become more important. A tester can relate them back he or she is creating in the team and contribute to the profitability of the company. The more unutilized your resources are, more you're wasting companies' money and time. Hence, optimization factor can align to your company's goal. We all know automation at scale needs buffer strategy. Specifically, if multiple engineers are contributing to it with the aim to release fast without compromising quality. Whenever um, I am assigned a new project, in fact, I joined any new employer, the first thing I do is understanding the landscape of testing in the product of the company. As you are aware, the automation testing usually resolves around three major aspects and twin tests, which are also called uh, functional tests. This basically focus on the user behavior, integration that it consists of API or component level tests, and finally the unit tests. So I basically start asking questions like, what is the distribution of manual and automation testing? How many UI test cases are automated? What is the strength of integration tests? In fact, do they even exist? What is the unit test coverage? What is the confidence level of the team in the automation? What is the go-to time, market time of a feature as soon as it is developed, that is a PR is raised? So as soon as I get answers to my questions, I always start observing patterns and more precisely the anti-patterns. The two most common anti-patterns that I observed are inverted pyramid or ice cone, ice cream cone pattern. In this anti-pattern, the team relies primarily on end-to-end -end tests using few integration tests, even fewer unit tests. R class, this anti-pattern is observed when the team starts with a lot of unit tests, then they use end-to-end -end tests where integration tests could be used. The R class has many unit tests at the bottom and many end-to-end -end tests at the top and very few or in fact negligible integration tests in the middle. So once you have observed the empty pattern, your obvious aim is to fix and reduce the deployment type with quicker time to market for your business features. Thus, what is the right automation strategy? One way of doing this is to use the test pyramid, which I'm sure you already have heard and right now even thought when I was mentioning about anti-patterns. So whether you are starting out a new software development project or working in an existing project, it is important to have a right strategy in place. The test pyramid, which is also known as automation pyramid, tells 
as the cost and slowness of automated test increases as one go up the pyramid. Establish your own test suite with simplicity of test pyramid that serves a good rule of thumb. Your best bet is to remember two things from test pyramid. Write test with different granularity. The more high level you get, the fewer tests you should have. Stick to the pyramid shape to come up with the healthy, fast, and maintainable test suite. Write a lot of small and fast unit tests. Write some course green tests and very few high level tests that test your application from end to end. Watch out that they don't end up with ice cream cone or inverted test pyramid. That will be a nightmare for you to maintain and take away too much time to run. Remember, the complexity rises of the test pyramid with more UI tests. Your execution and build time increases. The probability of writing of non-deterministic tests increases resulting fakeness. You have to keep the fragility at check. The setup cost increases as the UI test requires infrastructure. Finally, no doubt, your ops becomes very heavy. Having discussed this point, it does not mean that you don't have to write UI automated tests. They are very much required to have a right confidence from the user's perspective. The point is to have right balance of all capabilities so that you are capable to get early feedback and overall automation strategy gives you enough confidence to the team to release business features faster to market. Sometimes uh, when we want to adopt and implement a certain testing strategy or a model, it is observed that you're not able to do that, at least not in immediate future. This could be because of, uh, for example, monolithic or legacy code, or to use uh, mocking services, we tested a huge effort with a lot of refracting and attack tech of the team. Or writing unit tests gives 100% Code coverage is an overkill. So basically, if you're writing all unit tests and you say, I want to achieve 100% code coverage, that also may not be needed, or you're not able to do that. Then what is the way to get early feedback and have team confidence in the automation? From my experience, I've observed that though you cannot write many unit test cases, but they, we can still write integration tests. Hence, I could relate to another very good uh, testing model the testing trophy. It is a bottom to top approach in which basically static analysis is used in the development phase just below the unit test. That is, you use static type systems, a linter to capture basic errors like typos and syntax. Second, unit tests are reduced. The intent is not to write unit tests for code that don't have any logic. That is, write effective unit tests that target the critical behavior and functionality of your application. Integration tests should be maximum to test all the logical flows between different components. That is, develop integration tests to audit your application holistically. Make sure everything works together in harmony. Minimum end-to-end -end test case to automate mandatory UI functionality that cannot be tested or automated by integration test. That is, create end-to-end -end functional tests for automation of critical part, instead of relying on users to do it for you. There is no hard line on the percentage of each section, although I would advise to use what works best for your team based on the metric shared earlier. Good example could be if your business provides an infrastructure on the cloud and you have to automate the business logic that works on handling of that infrastructure unit. That is the unit setup, allocation, tear down and cleanup. To make sure that all components work seamlessly, you may have to write more integration tests. And writing unit tests may not be applicable there and probably doesn't make sense either. However, I would highly recommend to have static code analyzers in development phase, irrespective of the model opted. Static code analyzer helps you to impose coding guidelines and reduce and automate code reviews. Once you've identified the right model for automation strategy, let's dive into the characteristics of a good test case. A test case should be repeatable. It should yield same result on every execution or can be used to perform the test over and over. This is a test case should be 
consistent. For example, a user usually signs in with a valid username and password on a website. Here, the final state of a user should always be logged in, irrespective of the number of times you execute this test. Identify generic test cases. They should be written in such a way that you can, that the test case can be used in multiple test cases. Look for common stuff in all the test cases for the functionality they are automating. For example, the sign in, sign on functionality, search functionality of an e commerce website. Every test case should be defined, have a particular purpose. They should be clear, concise, and complete so that it supports the intended test scenario of the requirement. All test cases should be traced back to the actual requirement or spec. They should easily be trackable in the test automation reports too. That is, when a test case fails in the report, it should be easily identified which test case failed for the exact test reason. Test case should be atomic and always focus on one aspect without affecting the outcome of other tests. That is, test case focus on the one single feature, makes it clear on the intent of the test. If it fails, then you should have a clear of idea what needs to be fixed. Atomic test cases continuously ensure that your test cases test just one thing. It does not attempt to test various conditions in the single test case. To further explain all the mentioned attributes, let me pick an example of an e-commerce website. Consider a scenario where uh, an existing user purchases a product via card. So usual steps here for a user is to visit the e-commerce website, sign in using a valid username and password. They search a particular particular product with a certain keyword. Identify and select a product of choice and add to the cart. Finally, they purchase it using the correct payment method. So the atomic test should be the test sign in, test search, select product, test add to cart and test purchase. With these atomic steps defined, they can easily be reused multiple times with other scenarios. Like for example, existing signing user removes the item from the cart. In this scenario, user has to add few products to the cart to complete the test. So it's kind of a precondition. That is, atomic test step that are reused would be all of them and accept the test purchase step. Further signing, search, purchase could be required for the other flows. Testing them independently make sure that they are not retested for other flows. For other flows, we can simply spoof, sign up, search, and purchase via backend APIs, or even by setting the appropriate session cookies. Since we are no longer rewriting those steps, testing different flows is considerably faster. Running a single script for testing a huge flow leads to debugging nightmare. For the above example scenario, it is easier to know what broke the automation. Is it a sign up, search, purchase? We split the flow and breakages can be localized, fixed, and tested again quickly. Also, as these tests are now independent of each other, we can get faster results by testing them in parallel. Let me pick another scenario. Uh, an existing user add a product to a wish list. Here, you would have guessed Right, uh, just to, you need to create one atomic step, add to wish list. Other atomic steps can be reused again, like sign in, search, and select product. Thus, basically, if you see, it's very clearly observed that these test cases or test steps are repeatable with same expected outcome, irrespective of the number of time they're executed. They're reusable. They can be reused again and again. They are accurate. They serve the same intended purpose. They are traceable, can be related or tracked back to the stereo mentioned. They are atomic. Test only one thing at a time. So let's move to the next step, uh, refactoring code. While refactoring code, identify code smell and then eliminate them. Uh, like for example, uh, duplicate code. Remove two code fragments that look almost identical. Alternate classes with different interfaces. These are two classes that perform identical function but have different method names. Simplify the if statements. Possibly replace them with switch statements. This made code very easily readable and understandable. Split long methods. Generally, any method longer than 10 line of code should make you start thinking on the intent of the method. Dead code. 
delete a variable, parameter, field method, or a class which is no longer used. Remove all obsolete code. Long form files. Split your form files based on UI components on the page. If required, create subfolders accordingly. The mentioned pointers can easily be identified using static code analyzers too. Nowadays, IDs have very powerful capabilities to highlight and provide suggestions to fix the code smells. For example, IntelliJ IDEA, Visual Studio, JSPARO, LGT, and PMD, and so on. So usually in development phase, our static code analyzers are used to automatically examine code source before the program is executed. Similarly, we can even in, use this in our automation code and use the same concept. When a tester creates a PR, this tool can be triggered and executed. This helps in avoiding human errors during code reviews. In fact, you can even automate the whole code review using these tools. For example, if your, uh, your automation code is written in Ruby, then you can use Pronto Ruby Corp static code analyzer. With the right tools configured, this tool can automate your code review to a great extent and thus enhances your team productivity. Once uh, we are done with our authoring or writing of automated test cases, the next significant part is faster test execution. You have thousands of tests. How to make sure they run faster and give early feedback? In an agile world, speed matters with focus on high productivity without compromising the quality. With productivity, it's very crucial that you understand and value the time of a resource, whether it's a developer or a tester. The key is avoiding and minimizing the number of context switches. If a bug is found late when a developer has moved to next story or a feature development, then he or she has to come back and fix it. Similarly, if there is a high number of debt to QA cycles, productivity of team is hampered and team velocity goes down. So how do we get early feedback? The test execution time is essential. We all know selectors play a crucial role in the automation of UI tests using Selenium. Hence, for executing faster UI tests, we have to use them in the right way. Selectors let you search for a particular element on a web page you are testing. You can then interact with the element by clicking, sending keys, and so on. There are multiple types of selectors like find by ID, find by class, find by name, XPath, CSS. All of the selectors listed here find the same element, but there are few differences in their underlying implementation. Find by ID. ID is unique for a given element on a web page. Find by ID uses JavaScript's find element by ID, which is optimized for almost all browsers. Find by XPath. XPath search is based on traversing the DOM tree, trying to find the element which matches the expression. This itself takes a bit more time than finding by ID. Also, it is optimized for uh, all browsers, mostly older ones, especially the older IEs. ID may be missed for some elements, but XPath can be used to search all of them. Let me share uh, some of the benchmarking numbers that were crunched for find element by ID and XPath. For comparison, find element by ID and find element by XPath was run 50 times on the same element. This benchmarking was done on Instagram app, and it was observed that using ID was 14% faster than XPath. Similarly, the same experiment was done on Wikipedia app. In this case, using ID was 19% faster. To conclude, XPath can traverse up the DOM, that is from child to parent, whereas a CSS can only traverse down the DOM from parent to child. In modern browsers and mobile devices, CSS perform better than XPath. For faster test runs, your preference should be fast find element ID followed by CSS selectors, that is by class, name, text, and eventually XPath. Before moving to uh, my next slide, uh, I would like to emphasize that understand your application, how it behaves under different network and load conditions. Using appropriate libraries in your programming language of your choice, do the benchmarking on the performance of selector against the test application under the same network conditions as your regression suite will run. So moving uh, next to APIs, um, using 
API smartly in conjunction with UA test really helps. Remember the test pyramid, which I talked a few minutes back. The right balance of using both UI and API tests is the key. Wherever possible, use APIs to reach the initial state of the main test objective. That brings to my previous example of e-commerce website, where an existing user signs in and should be able to remove all elements from the cart in the web page. Here, we can easily move some common steps that bring the user to the initial state of the of already having certain product added to the cart. Using the API exposed by the product, that is sign in, search product, add to cart, sign out. So what are the benefits that we observe with the API testing? They provide us faster feedback and hence reduce the execution time. They reduce the cost and helps in increasing the productivity without compromising the quality. Can be used and integrated with uh, UI functional test and mocking service. It is interface uh, independent and as data is exchanged using XML or JSON. That is, your main application and automation services can be implemented in totally different languages. With the using of mocking service, you can test early, as early in the development phase, before even the code is pushed to a, a test of our testing. This helps in reducing the dead QA cycles. Next, Selenium weights. As we all know, Selenium weights are very important for executing automated test scripts. Use of weights help us to handle different variations in time, like for loading of web elements on web page. Most web applications are AJAX and JavaScript based. So page load on browser, we see various web elements that take and interact with different load times at different intervals. This is obviously creates difficulty in identifying the right element of, and we usually see element not visible exception. So basically Selena Waves helps us here a lot. So to use the smart, it's very important that we understand the application behave in the test ecosystem under different network conditions. I'm sure you all are aware of different Selenium ways like implicit, ex explicit, and fluent. Hence, I won't dive into their definition. In fact, the points that you need to keep here while we're handling the time lags and agile requests are immediately stop using thread.c. I have observed quite often that many uh, developers or automation engineers use thread.c a lot. They usually wrap them with uh, while loops with a duration of one, side, uh, one second. And this easily goes across and adopted by everyone else across the automation code. Hence, thus avoid it. You should only use explicit weight. Implicit weight, once set, are effective throughout the user browser session. Once I observe too much implicit weights you will use throughout the code, and just removing them, I could reduce the execution time by 30%. And third, don't mix implicit and explicit weight. This can cause you unpredictable wait times. For example, setting an implicit wait of 10 seconds and explicit of 15 seconds cause a huge time out of 20 seconds. Further, it is observed that implicit waits are often implemented on remote side of a web driver system, where explicit waits are implemented exclusively on the local language binding. Thus, if you're using a remote web driver or a Selenium gate, you may strain to undefined behavior unpredictability. So don't do that. Use explicit way with expected conditions. Another powerful tool in our arsenal for our faster execution is scalability with parallelization. When number of automated test cases increases, it is important that we should have optimized infrastructure to run them properly and parallelly. Two important factors that you should consider are parallelization and dockerization. With many teams working in tandem, the jobs to run test for them to also increases exponentially. For example, if you're using CI/CD tools like Jenkins, there should be enough number of slaves to run all the tests and the jobs. So how do you increase the Jenkins slaves on demand? That is, how do you scale horizontally? Quite often I've seen that automation or DevOps engineer manually set up Jenkins slave machines or to optimize it uses AWS auto scaling. What usually missed is, that the slave machine resources are not used fully or your resource utilization is not optimal. 
Thus, the recommendation is the dockerization of the test infrastructure. Dockers help us to utilize all the resources for the machine that are that you are paying for. With the dockers, you can easily configure multiple slaves in a single machine. Use parallelization capabilities of or features of the testing frameworks to run your test in parallel. Combine this with Selenium Grid that can be set up locally or preferably use that are available on the cloud. For example, consider test ng framework. Test ng provides an auto defined XML file where one can set the parallel attributes to method, test, classes. And by using the concept of multi threading of Java, one can set the right number of threads and can achieve parallel execution. It is also known fact that penalization help reduce execution time. One can complete the test cycle faster, executing in quicker delivery, also leading to better ROI. An interesting fact to note is sometimes just increasing the number of threads may not substantially reduce the execution time. Due to, for example, it could be related to external factors or limitation of resources that are allocated to you. So choosing the right threads is very important. That is, use the right thread pool size. However, they are caveats to parallel testing. In case of parallelization, for different modules to run in parallel, you need to create independent modules. Modules with dependency cannot be included in parallel approach. For parallelization, one needs to have a detailed understanding of the product, its flow for a better results. Even though parallelization can help in cross-browser compatibility testing, its coverage of multiple browsers is restricted until unless it is accompanied by distributed testing where a uh, setup of multiple machine browsers is provided. Owing to the need of having access to multiple platforms and browsers to run tests in parallel, the cost of compatibility testing with parallel testing increases. Also, you may come to a point where access to all the browsers and version may not be possible. Hence, opting for a cloud-based testing really helps. Use of cloud-based provider enables you to do distributed testing across the globe, which is very resourceful. The teams that are not on Docker usually face interesting challenges, like how to always get a clean state of the setup before the automation starts. How effective is my automation infra? How to simplify the test setup? Is it doing an, doing an upgrade of pain? Dockerization of testing automation infrastructure helps us solve these problems. As Docker enable us to utilize resource fully, they give us ROI, help us save costs. It helps decrease deployment time. Our test automation runs or Jenkins slaves that are running on containers are completely segregated and isolated from each other. They provide full isolation of the file system, network, and processes. This ability guarantees us clean setup and help reduce flakiness. Docker simplifies and provides flexibility to users to take their own configuration, put that into code, and further deploy it without any problems. For continuous integration, Docker works well using tools like Travis, or Jenkins, or even Team City. These tools help us in version management using Docker image every time a source code is updated. With the help of a Docker, we can build a container image and can further use this image over every step of deployment process with the ability to run jobs in parallel. In fact, you can queue them. This helps us make our CI CD efficient. So to conclude, use right metrics and monitor them to make sure you're on the right track. Use the right test strategy, whether you opt test pyramid or testing trophy. Choose after understanding your testing landscape. Make sure your test cases are atomic and you practice good test case characteristics. Start using APIs in UI functional tests. It helps in faster execution and reduce flakiness. Execute your tests parallelly and move your test setup to Docker. So that's it from my end. Uh, thank you all for attending the session. I hope you learned something new today. So Chitwin, hi. Uh, we have a few questions in the discuss uh, tab mm -hmm. in the Q&A. 
under the Q&A section. Yeah, so, sure. So uh, can we calculate code coverage of Selenium test with respect to web application code? There are some tools uh, which you can do, but you need to tweak them. Uh, in what ratio we should divide the test cases in unit integration E to E level? I would say that work as a team to identify that. Uh, giving numbers, it depends upon the organization, uh, the application, and the business use case. That is why I've mentioned earlier the use of metrics. Those metrics help you to gauge all the required uh, level for all the unit orientation and to a level. In Agile Scrum model, what is the best, best practice to do automation in same print or next print? Uh, practically speaking, I have seen there is always a spillover. So, which actually works sometimes because before the next story comes in for you to test, you can actually write the automated test set, you know, test cases from the previous sprint. So, if you're practicing right, it, it usually doesn't it, it take care automatically. If you're proper, you've done proper sprint planning and everything. Any other questions? It's the team who is, oh, sorry, the question is an agile who is responsible for the quality. I would say it's the whole team. It's the whole team who is responsible for the quality. Can we uh, segregate which test to run parallelly and which test not? It depends. Uh, uh, say, for example, uh, if you are using any resources that depend on, uh, it could be your you know, desktop or it could be browsers or your devices in that case you have you may have to have a queen concept over there you may have to queue your test cases so i would say that uh, do proper judgment and see how things are working don't uh, put things you know without thinking and proper analysis hence i really emphasize everyone to have a proper judgment of how things are working in a framework adopt and monitor it regulated regular table as it as, as a team you should you should try to do that Uh, we okay. have one more question, uh, two more actually. Where I can see those? Is is using static variables causes trouble in running test in parallel? Yes, they do. Depends upon how you have uh, written the code, how you're using them. It, it depends. So it totally depends how you have uh, uh, you know written the automation framework. You have to be very careful while using them. Should we also capture number of defects found manually in metrics? Uh, I would say that do both of them if possible. Uh, it will help you uh, to, in a wrong run, to know what is the what is the you know uh, where where is we as a team you need to improve on. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. There is one more difference between parallelization, parallelization, and dockerization. Okay, so it's very simple, right? You are you are starting your test on a on your laptop or on a desktop, right? Uh, you can spawn five different Firefox browsers, right? You say in testing the example that I gave using using parallel methods, you spawn it and you are running it. It is parallelization, right? Dockerization helps you when you want to scale as a team. Imagine you have 5,000 of tests or 10,000 of tests you want to run. And you want to divide your tests because you have multiple pipelines. So assume that you have multiple repos. Now many people are moving to microservices, right? So you want to have multiple pipelines. So how do you very do clean setup? And the one test is finished, there should be a clean environment for the next test when it starts or next job when it starts. So dockerization helps in that. So Dockerization is basically for your infrastructure. Parallelization is for your test cases. You can even run Rokery, you can even run Selenium Grid, or you can even run uh, on your uh, in a cloud uh, Selenium Grid. 